And this is Politics and Media 101. I'm Jeff Browning. Justin Chang is a film critic for the LA Times and for NPR's Fresh Air. But in addition to having fascinating opinions about what makes movies good or less than good, he also knows a lot about the forces behind those movies. As many viewers have switched from theaters to streaming, and as the COVID pandemic has impacted people's willingness to see movies in theaters, the business behind movies has changed, impacting the variety and the quality of choices we have. We talked to Justin about all of this, about American cinema's place in the world, about how the Academy Awards are changing, and about how incredible it can be to experience other cultures through their movies. He even shared some pro tips for where beginners can look to find the best foreign films. Like all of our episodes, this is an edited version of a much longer conversation that was taped live. For information about how to join us or past episodes, please visit our website, pm101.live. Please also take a second to subscribe on whichever streaming service you're using right now so you don't miss our next episode this Monday featuring Marcy Wheeler, an independent journalist who specializes in national security and civil liberties. Our co-founders Justin Higgins and John Gunnison led the interview. Without any further ado, let's roll the tape. I have to say, I don't love every movie nominated for Best Picture, although I like the great majority of them. And I think they actually present a somewhat optimistic picture of the state of cinema, maybe even more optimistic than we have any right to expect, especially after the past few years, which have uh, wreaked havoc on so many industries, the entertainment industry and the movie industry very much included. But you just I'll, I'll go through the, the list of nominees. You know, you have Belfast, a personal memoir, coming of age drama. You have Coda, a family drama and a Sundance Prize winner, so something rep, you know more representative of the of the indie spe- spectrum. You have Don't Look Up, which is an apocalyptic dark comedy. You have Drive My Car, you know, an art house drama from Japan, which is, by the way, my favorite movie of last year, and to me, the movie that deserves to win the Best Picture Oscar, hands down. You have Dune, which is a big sci-fi blockbuster. You have King Richard, an inspirational sports drama. You have Licorice Pizza, a shaggy 1970s comedy. N- Nightmare Alley, a neo noir. The Power of the Dog, a Western, some would call it a revisionist Western, and West Side Story, a musical. I think that's all 10. But you just look at that range of genres. Um, I think it really does fulfill a kind of best picture ideal, which is to offer something for everyone, uh, ostensibly everyone. Uh, Some would say, of course, that but where's the superhero movie? <laughs> so it's like, because there was a big uproar over, oh, Spider-Man No Way Home should have been nominated. There was a big push to get that movie nominated. And because superhero movies, comic book movies have so just dominated uh, the industry, um, what audiences look for, and I, I think to the detriment of movies overall, I look at this list of Best Picture nominees, and I think it paints a pretty... What, there, a, a pretty wide range of movies and a wide range of genres, something to satisfy everybody. So before I let uh, my partner here just dig in and get into it with you, I have to ask your opinion on Don't Look Up. So I'm going to preface it with, I think it's a really, really bad movie. And I find the only people that enjoy the movie are are my very far left progressive friends because it speaks to kind of their worldview. And I am not by any means a movie critic. I am just your, you know, normal everyday movie goer. Uh, but to me, it was just so in your face. It was almost dumbed down in an offensive way of just repeating the same thing over and over again and making it very clear. Um, even if I do somewhat agree with the message or totally agree with the message, what are your thoughts though on, on Don't Look Up? Yeah, my thoughts are not that different from yours, to be honest. I mean, I. Um, I didn't hate the movie. There are redeeming things about it to me. Um, I think I liked it better than Adam McKay's previous film, Vice, which was also up for a slew of Oscars. Uh, that's his, his Dick Cheney biopic, which I just thought was really pretty bad. Um, I'm not a big fan of this mode that McKay is in at the moment. I am a fan of movies like Step Brothers and Talladega Nights and, you know, the, the, the Will Ferrell comedies. I mean, that phase of his career seems to be behind him, and he's sort of abandoned it for what I think is a very self-important mode of filmmaking. Um, 
this started with the big short which uh which was up for a number of oscars and i believe one um won a screenplay oscar if i remember that correctly I, I could be completely wrong um and vice and now this um and i yeah i, I find it very hectoring. I just don't find it very successful as comedy either. I mean, I have to say, I don't have a problem with um, a movie that is takes it upon itself to teach us something or to, you know, and, and he's clearly, you know, he and, and other, uh, his collaborators on Don't Look Up have said this movie is an allegory for climate change and it's about human apathy in the face of impending apocalyptic destruction. And what I really disliked and found to be a really bad faith argument on their part was that if we rejected the movie, that we were basically like, to reject this movie is to reject the truth of climate change and you're basically a denialist. And I find that to be just a uh, total hogwash. And I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, across the spectrum would, you know, heed the warnings about the seriousness of climate change. And that doesn't mean we have to like this movie, which I agree with you is just really broad, really snarky, um, very pleased with itself. I think the movie works better dramatically than it does comedically. The Academy and ABC who aired the Academy telecast they seem to be absolutely terrified of irrelevance all the time. And they act uh, out of a sense of panic in the decisions that they make about the broadcast and also about the ceremony itself. And, you know, cinema was described as being the great art form of the 20th century. How concerned are you that it's losing its place as the dominant uh, go-to, the preferred medium for entertainment and cultural engagement among the general public? Is that a concern that you share? I mean, it, it does sadden me in some ways uh, because I love movies and I uh, I, love, I I make a living writing about them. So I'm really hoping to, you know, quite apart from loving the movies, um, uh, I, I want to be able to keep going on writing about them. Um, that said, this has been this has been going on for a while now. I think uh, someone very smart once said, uh, you know, another critic actually said, um, you know, the history of the 21st century, I hate to break it to you, is not going to be written in the language of motion pictures, uh, motion pictures as we understand it in terms of cinema. Panic is a very good word to describe what's going on with the Academy and ABC at the moment, because they are terrified that nobody's seen these nominees. I think they're wrong to assume that, by the way. I think more people have seen the movies than people may realize you know abc has been extremely hard on them to this show must be three hours long um they forced them to cut eight categories uh production design sound original score editing and live action short documentary short and animated shorts we forget the craft categories the the, the very talented people who work on the movies and who you know help to realize the films that we enjoy and we give them short shrift uh so to speak uh with regard to the short film so it's it's it, it, and I, I i of course you understand the academy's reason uh the the abc's reasoning behind that but i think it's such a missed opportunity to raise up the next generation of film lovers people like me who started watching the oscars at age eight and fell in love with um movies partly through that it wasn't the extent of my film education but it was you know, a very imperfect but very important beginning of a film education for me and I think for a lot of people. And so, and I think the Academy is at ABC's behest sort of chasing an audience that doesn't exist. They're chasing this imaginary audience member who is suddenly going to watch the show because, oh, they cut the editing category. Therefore, I am going to suddenly watch this show that would have been three and a half hours and now is only, is only going to be three hours. Yes, that is worth my time. Or they're going to watch the show because they're doing some stupid Twitter-sourced Oscar fan-favorite nonsense that is you know going to take place and basically make the Oscars more like the People's Choice Award. Uh, choice awards and, of course, presumably give a movie like Spider-Man No Way Home its moment in the Oscar spotlight. So, Well, Justin, I, this, yeah. um, this imaginary viewer is so excited to see the Twitter poll, but is not excited to see Samuel L. Jackson win his Lifetime Achievement Award. That's not I, important to televise, right? Absolutely. I mean, and <laughs> you're talking about it's – unfortunately, those, those honorary Oscars um, have not been part of the main telecast for a while now. And – it's a real shame. You know, if really quick digression, 20 or 20 years after the Oscar ceremony where 
Denzel Washington and Halle Berry won the lead acting Oscars, marking the first time a black woman has won Best Actress, and sadly the, the only time, and the first time that both lead acting Oscars went to um, went to black act performers. And not coincidentally, or coincidentally, I don't know, they gave an honorary Oscar to Sidney Poitier that very night. And um, Sidney Poitier, of course, who was the first black man to win um, a lead acting Oscar. And so the symbolic importance of that night 20 years ago when you had Halle Berry and Denzel Washington win. Denzel Washington had presented the the honorary Oscar to Sidney Poitier and then there was this beautiful, it's still one of the most moving moments in any Oscar cast in history where he salutes Sidney Poitier and Sidney Poitier salutes him back and they are standing and holding their Oscars to each other. I'm getting, you know, you get choked up just thinking about this. And if Poitier hadn't been, if they hadn't given that award out, that moment wouldn't have happened. And so you see you know, that that's kind of maybe a once-in-a-lifetime kind of moment, kind of achievement, but you see what is lost when you treat all this stuff as just filler that can that is expendable. And when you you know, this is a night, one night out of the year. I I feel like the Oscars um should always be long. Like give them their moment. This is just once a year. What is the rush? Um ratings, okay, ratings, ratings, but like let the industry honor its own. And People in the industry, of course, have spoken out about just how disrespectful this is to to shunt those eight categories aside. And they're basically going to, I believe, pre-tape them and then air air clips on during the show. And, and so they're basically trying to just cram them in. But I do think it's extremely disrespectful. And, and I think the Academy is very rightly being um, called out for it. Disney, spending more than $52 billion to buy a significant portion of 21st Century Fox. Disney CEO Bob Iger sealing the deal with Rupert Murdoch, who built the Fox global empire. Tonight, how this deal could change the way many families watch movies, TV, sports, choosing when and where they'll watch. Disney has the opportunity to command the space they're in. What do you make of this deal, and is this part of that commanding focus? So what Disney might have the power to do, especially with Marvel and Star Wars and even their their um, resort parks and cruise lines, is to do pull out the ultimate gangster move and put all of this behind a wall and say, all of you have to enter into a Prime-like or Netflix-like recurring revenue relationship with something offered by Disney. One of the things that you mentioned when you're talking about the health of cinema is the case of Nightmare Alley, right? You you know, this is a movie, it cost $60 million to make, it made $11 million domestic, it, a huge disappointment. Uh, but the context for this is something that's connected to a pretty big and important theme in the broader U.S. economy, which is consolidation, right? Mm-hmm. So this movie was released after the Disney acquisition of Fox, and um, uh, as a consequence of that, also the Fox Searchlight specialty label. Yes. And there's been this question of how much Disney were really going to support these kinds of movies that Fox Searchlight uh, developed and, and distributed, and sometimes acquired and distributed. Um, and, and so we talked to an antitrust expert on this same program just about two weeks ago about the effect that consolidation has uh, to consumers. Because uh, when these major companies combine and there's fewer uh, you know, big distributors in the marketplace, it really does affect the kind of of choices that we get as consumers and the way that they're marketed and, and promoted and made accessible to us. So it, are you noticing a big difference in the diversity and quality of you know, product, for the lack of a better word, that we get as a consequence of these kinds of mergers and consolidation that are happening in this industry? Yeah, absolutely. And I think bringing up Nightmare Alley and Searchlight in particular is is a very apt thing to do because Searchlight Pictures, uh, its brand, you know, uh, you know, it's previously Fox Searchlight, and I, I, I think that the Disney acquisition of Fox, by the way, is is pretty tragic. Um, I think it it does, it you know, people have, were of course calling it the end of an era, and it's but it's it's just that you know a historic movie studio with its own imprint, its own identity, and um, now being sort of subsumed. By or into um, the larger Disney. I mean, you know, Disney is a big umbrella, of course, but you, do, you know, Disney does have this these family friendly associations. You do wonder 
to what degree are they going to to support movies that are somewhat more cutting edge, I suppose you would say, or geared toward adults. Searchlight is the studio that uh, Searchlight distributed Nomadland, um, a wonderful movie that I, I you know, very intimate, uh, modestly scaled movie that won Best Picture last year. Um, they are behind movies like Twelve Years a Slave and, and Birdman and, and The Favorite and The Tree of Life. I mean, these movies, which without which um, I think our movie going diet would be <laughs> immeasurably poorer. Um, you know, it, this kind of consolidation just goes up and down. I mean, I think uh, the news just re- recently broke that Amazon is, you know, its purchase of MGM, another historic movie studio, is sort of imminent. As far as my having noticed the effects of this, I mean, it, it's hard to maybe say it that specifically that, oh, as a direct result, yeah, I mean, it, I think we're still getting used to it. But in terms of just the diminishing quality, diversity kinds of movies, yeah, I would say so. Um I think we have to talk, too, about just the shift to streaming. Um, the past few years, you know, how many streaming platforms have, have sprung up? You know, Disney+, Plus, Apple+, Plus, Paramount+, Plus, every, every plus of every kind. And there is just this sense now that it has to be a particular kind of movie to earn a theatrical release. No movie is guaranteed a theatrical release anymore. And, and part of this is due to the pandemic. I mean, when Warner Brothers decided that oh, everything's going to go concurrently in theaters and HBO Max. I mean, that was a decision that was widely decried by many in the industry, including some people like Christopher Nolan, for example, who who no longer is tied to Warner Brothers anymore as a result. People who, filmmakers and, and film artists who really value that theatrical experience. Um, and it's like, who are the directors now who can still command a theatrical release? Well, you know, maybe somebody like Denis Villeneuve, the director of Dune, um, which was a big theatrical hit, and that's kind of a bright spot in an otherwise rough year. Um, Villeneuve also complained very much. He said something, I can't remember what the exact quote was, but it's like, it's like saying, like, watching Dune at home on your TV is like jet skiing in your bathtub or something. I may be misquoting that. But, uh, you know, someone like Steven Spielberg can still command a, a, a theatrical audience, but... West Side Story flopped in theaters, and that was extremely disappointing. I'm a real believer that uh, you know movies do. You know, movies are best seen in theaters. Um, I know a lot of people disagree, and some people, you know, and they're used to just streaming everything at home now. And I, I love the convenience of streaming too, but um, but I uh, I miss theaters even now, and so and I can't wait to get back to them. Kind of you know, at, kind of at full throttle. So yeah. Since we're talking about the diversity of options that we as consumers of cinema have available to us. I want to pivot this conversation towards something that I know, Justin, that you are very passionate about, that I share your passion for, which is uh, international cinema, non-English language cinema. And I think, um, I hope that we're going to have enough time to give this part of the conversation as much uh, as it deserves. But let's kind of just start by taking stock of the, uh, you know, the dominance of Hollywood in the global film marketplace and how we got here, how we got to the point where people think of a movie and they immediately think of Hollywood, not just in the United States, but in the export markets. Justin, how did we get to the stage where Hollywood have become so powerful that they've become the the big player, almost a dominant player, in, in not just in the U.S., but in all these global markets? Yeah, it's funny. I'm actually in the middle of Eric Schwartzel's book, um, Red Carpet, which is all about um, – you know, China and Hollywood. Um, I, I, I just started it and it's, it's, it's very illuminating just about, um, you know, the way in which China did this, but especially in the U S and really seeing cinema in its early days as just, uh, as a, as a propaganda tool for, um, you know, and a propaganda tool that can of course be used, um, to many different ends. And I just think, you know, um, America has been that enormous exporter, you know, this is the movies were it's great cultural export for, Many many years and still is, I, I think, I hope. But um, but the downside of that is because to c- circle back to what you were saying, it's like yeah, I the Amerocentrism of the Academy Awards, um, since that's what we're talking about. You know, the mistaken belief that Hollywood and the movies are completely synonymous. I mean, one of the pleasures of my job as a movie critic is getting to write about cinema from all over the world. And I'm not even saying I do like the greatest job of it. I'm just saying that is a that is one of the great rewards of the job because even the the, the I see more movies from other 
countries outside the U.S. than I would say most moviegoers do. And even then, I know what I'm seeing is a very unrepresentative fraction of what's actually out there. I'm always sort of banging the drum as much as I can, um, uh, you know, with with what resources I have to try to get people to watch um, different kinds of movies from different cultures and different countries that they may not know. And it's really kind of appalling when you look back <clears throat> and you see that before Parasite really shattered that particular glass ceiling by winning Best Picture, becoming the first Korean film to win Best Picture, the first non-English language film to win Best Picture. It took 92 years for that to happen. You look back over the 92 years before that and what non-English language movies, um, I'm trying very hard, by the way, to banish the word foreign in respect to this, you know, because the Academy renamed its the category from foreign language film to international feature. Um, and I, I actually Which itself that. created all kinds of confusion, right? Because they... All kinds of... Yeah, yeah they can only consider <laughs> movies that aren't in English. I think BAFTA call it non-English language film, right? I mean, that's... Maybe it's not right. elegant, but it's the most accurate it's, description. You, you said it perfectly. It is not the most elegant, but I think it is the most accurate and, and the most um, kind of edifying term for it. Um, I'm a member of the Los Angeles Film Critics Association, and we, just this past year, um, also changed our award previously known as Best Foreign Language Film to uh, Best uh, Film Not in the English Language. Um, and so... It, you look at the number of non-English language films that have been nominated for Best Picture and that never won. Films like uh, Grand Illusion, Jean Renoir's great masterpiece, Grand Illusion, uh, Z, uh, The Emigrants, Cries and Whispers, um, Il Postino, Life is Beautiful, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Um, I guess Clint Eastwood's Letters from Iwo Jima counts, but that's you know, I mean, and, and that's a great movie. Um, but you know, it's a Hollywood movie too. But it's it, it that happens to be Japanese and told from a Japanese perspective. Um, Amour and Roma a few years ago, and, and now Parasite. And Parasite was the first and still is the only one. The Academy is a more international organization than it has ever been. And as a result of that, I think it is a smarter organization, a more discerning organization, and a more interesting organization. So, um, so I think that Years ago, a movie like Drive My Car and maybe even a movie like Parasite, which is, you know, um, probably a more accessible film or very, you know, it's, it's a thriller. Those movies would not have been guaranteed to crack Best Picture because, you know, the Academy is still overwhelmingly um, older, white and male, but less so than it was a few years ago. I, I think there's really this a, a lot of value that people can get by watching these kinds of movies for learning about the world and learning about other cultures and perspectives. And we're seeing this in the news now where amidst a very justified and righteous uh, boycott of many Russian companies, um, we're also seeing an unfortunate boycott of Russian culture, uh, including yeah. Russian cultural products or Russian cultural items that have no connection to current events. Uh, people who are going to come and perform a Tchaikovsky concert uh, <laughs> are seeing that canceled. Uh, Tchaikovsky died 100 years before Putin became the leader of Russia. And I, I think that this is a time when there should be more engagement with Eastern Slavic culture, people trying to understand the perspectives of Russians and Ukrainians, to, to understand uh, more about that situation, more about the people who are involved. And uh, Justin, could you maybe help me make this case and, and talk about, maybe with some examples, the things that you've learned about other cultures, maybe even including Russia and Ukraine, by watching cinema, and maybe some recommendations that, that people... Uh, should hear from you um, that they should seek out to learn more about the world outside the United States. Yeah, I mean that's a great that's uh, that's a great point, and I whole, uh, wholeheartedly agree. You just reminded me, and, and I am not. I hasten to add, you know, I am not a, 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 an expert on Soviet or Russian cinema by any means. However, um, <clears throat> you know, in years of going to festivals, I mean, one of my one director I like a great deal. Um, is a Russian director named uh, Andrei Zvyagintsev. He's made some really wonderful movies over the years, um, like The Return, um, uh, Loveless. Uh, oh, what was the um, Leviathan? Leviathan. Leviathan. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I saw that at the Abu Dhabi yeah. Film Festival. Oh. I didn't get it at the time. I need to rewatch it. Probably. <laughs> I'm so glad you've seen it. It's it's a really. I think it's a beautiful film. And that movie, if if you may recall, um, is you know uh, strikingly uh anti-putin to a degree that makes you shocked at the fact that it received russian funding and russian permission to play at the Cannes film festival so it's like 
that's also just there's all sorts of contradictions when you get into this too in terms of funding in terms of you know sort of official um approval of these movies to be exported and and you know and and russia is actually you know seem you know seems strikes me in my limited understanding um as kind of more hands-off about that kind of thing than say a country like china which is extremely um yeah, it can be extremely punitive when it comes to filmmakers and films that they do not approve of and do not give their official, um, you know, approval to. So, so some, so I think Zviagintsev is just a filmmaker, one of many Russian filmmakers who came to mind, but him especially because here's somebody who is, you know, in many ways, I think a critical artist, a, a perhaps even a dissident artist, um, someone who's been quite openly critical of the regime. And it's like, what do you do with a filmmaker like that? I mean, a blanket boycott. Um, does not, I think, uh, of of his work and other work does not, um, you know, I don't think does not serve anyone. Um, and I, I know this is complicated, but it's, uh, you know, I, I'm curious to see, too, what happens with, um, you know, I believe that the Cannes Film Festival has banned um, Russian delegations. But as far as I know, I don't think they've banned Russian films and filmmakers. And I can, I, I would be willing to bet that they want to continue to um, keep supporting that. But also, perhaps, I mean, I'm curious to see what the Ukrainian presence is at this upcoming festival. I mean, Cannes is really, it, it's, and I, I keep talking about it because it really is sort of like, an international summit for for filmmakers every year, and it's the most important one in the world. And so you really do get this not perfectly representative, but very helpful snapshot of what is going on in world cinema. Tonight, we've hopefully brought to light the impact that films have made and can make on our lives as individuals, and on society as a whole. And the Oscar goes to Parasite. And the Oscar goes to Rami Rami Malek. Malek. And the Oscar goes to Argo. And you're talking about these, I I assume, very high pieces of art. But somebody like me, maybe, who occasionally watches a non-English film, what would you recommend? Maybe something for somebody like me who's interested and wants to catch the bug that you and John so clearly have. When I was first starting to watch movies, I, I didn't I didn't know where to start either. But you know, I didn't start just watching you know Godard movies and suddenly getting them. I mean, it's that's like that's there's like you know it's I I, I mentioned early on it's about a film education and for me that's sort of a lifelong process. There's a lovely French movie called Petite Maman that is coming out soon, and it's like um, it is not severe, it is not austere, it is like seventy something minutes, and it's an absolutely beautiful story about um, a mother and daughter, and I won't say much more than that because there are some surprises in it. Watch Seven Samurai, you know, a great Kurosawa movie. Watch um, Francois Truffaut's The 400 Blows. I mean, look up the the, the sight and sound top... <clears throat> Top 100 Critics Poll, where there are tons of great international movies. It's a, it's a great list of world movies that are highly acclaimed. And yes, some of them are more challenging than others. But by and large, you, you, you watch one of the movies on this list, you will not go wrong. Is there a like dividing line between, I guess you'd say, I don't want to say lowbrow, maybe populist cinema and uh, art cinema? And if there is a division, uh, what makes the two different? Oh, my gosh. Like, why isn't Don't Look Up? Not art cinema. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a really that's a really good question that I an- I will try to answer with some trepidation because I and I I probably started this by mentioning the brows. I don't like to talk about brows so much. If you're speaking just within, say, you know, mainstream Hollywood comedy, maybe don't look up is actually on the higher brow end of that spectrum because it's about something important. And partly why I reject the movie and think it's kind of a crock is because I just don't think it's nearly. Um, I, I just find that its message that it's so proud of just does not resonate in the way that it thinks it does. And I'm also a little skeptical, actually, about movies that think that the best way to approach the climate change subject is by speaking an allegorical code. You know, I actually, uh, my colleague Sam Adams um, um, wrote a really great piece in Slate about that and about sort of the, in some, really 
tackling the fallacy of like, oh, this movie's a metaphor for this and that, and this is why, it, and therefore it is a more you know important and subtle work of art because of that. And I actually don't think that's necessarily true. Justin, I can also add to some of your recommendations for accessible, popular, non-English language movies. There's a lot, you know, Park Chan Wook, Old Boy, anything, Moldavar, especially early 2000s, uh, John Woo, Hong Kong action movies, Burning, oh, the recently Chan Don one, Tony Erdman. So um, knowing Hollywood movies as thoroughly as you also do, uh, we've been talking about what we learned from watching imports. What do you think the people in the global market are learning about America by watching Hollywood movies? What kind of message are we sending out to the world about us and about who we are? Oh, God. Oh, my God. That's a really good question that I am. I feel like the messages that we are putting out there, I mean, are such a jumble. I do think that. Um, a focus on, you know, individualism and just, I mean, and, and just liberty. I mean, these are, you know, American values that are, you know, that we like to trumpet very loudly. And and I do think that that is startling to a lot of people. I think also just, you know, I mean, Hollywood, can we talk about glamour, just the glamour of Hollywood? I mean, that is just something, I mean, that is something that does travel very well. And I think, and it's funny because that is not necessarily so representative of American life. I mean, it's, it's kind of a heightened representation of American life. I think that people like to stereotype about Hollywood as just being, oh, a hotbed of liberalism run amok. And I don't know if I, – I actually don't think that's entirely true. I mean, you see what happens when Hollywood broaches hot-button topics. You know, um, you see this – actually the kind of the cowardice and the complacency that sometimes sets in when, say, um, you know, in terms of their depictions of religion, per se. And, and it's just like there's actually a real – a curious kind of timidity that kind of comes into Hollywood's um, political representation. So sometimes I wonder, and I, it's it's hard. It's, I'm trying to put myself in the the the, mi the mindset of someone who you know isn't American who's watching these movies and what how it hits them. And I would just say sometimes I don't know. I think the image we project is not quite so. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's not so firm or courageous as we like to think it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> so before we go to the audience, I was wondering if you could grace us with any Oscar predictions so that I can sound smart when I'm watching them with my friends who are much smarter than I am. Um, but first, I, I wanted to start with Best Actress, because I know that that is, might be more difficult this year. Do you have any predictions for us in, in that category? I like to think that Best Actress is still pretty wide open because... Um, the smart money would probably be on Jessica Chastain to win for her performance as Tammy Faye Baker in uh, The Eyes of Tammy Faye. I, uh, she won the Screen Actors Guild Award, um, which is generally seen as a very important predictor of Best Actress, although it doesn't always line up, but a lot of the time it does. Um, and, uh, and there's significant overlap with the actors branch of the Academy. So if you had to take a guess, I would say probably Jessica Chastain. I, 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 I think she's a wonderful actress. Um, I'm, I don't think this is her best work, so I actually do hope it's someone else. Um, and, um, I mean, I really liked Kristen Stewart and Spencer. Um, I loved Olivia Coleman in The Lost Daughter, and I'm actually rooting for Penelope Cruz in Pedro Almodovar's um, Parallel Mothers. Almodovar is just a wonderful director um, if you're looking to watch movies that capture a time a time and place that you may not know very well um and you know he's he's a great spanish filmmaker whose name is um you know he is probably as close to a household name as there is um in world cinema and parallel mothers is just a i think it's a masterpiece actually and i really hope people will seek that out and penelope cruz is just absolutely beyond wonderful in it, it it's also a very political movie a lot of stuff about very the political Civil war it's, legacy of the spanish Civil war. sounds like it's, i would enjoy it i will check it out uh, Justin, I think that you mentioned that you saw Power of the Dog as the front runner for the top prize. Is that about right? And I also want to know if you have any big upsets, maybe in some of the below the line categories. Any, you know, maybe we can help people win uh, some, uh, some money <laughs> with good odds here. Oh, I'm ter like a lot of critics. I am legendarily terrible at this, and I tend probably would lose people money more than win. But yeah, I mean, the Power of the Dog is the front runner for best picture. It's won um, the uh, it won the DGA, the Director's Guild Award for Jane Campion. Um, she is definitely going to win Best Director. I think everyone considers her a lock. This is her second nomination. 
Um, and she's the first woman to earn more than one nomination for Best Director, which is both wonderful and kind of sad. Um, just shows you how few women are acknowledged in Best Director. Um, so Jane Campion is definitely going to win. But I think for Best Picture, The Power of the Dog might be seen as sort of a shaky front runner. Um, a lot of people think that the momentum is shifting toward CODA. Um, which is a movie that screened at Sundance last year and has, you know, was not considered a um, a huge awards contender. But by golly, you know, it's the the significance of its deaf representation. Um, three of the four principal actors are deaf, and this is very much a story. A child, Coda, you know, it's it stands for Child of Deaf Adults, and so it's about this um, woman played by Amelia Jones and her how she. Um, uh, how she um, interacts with her um, her deaf mom, uh, father, and brother. And so this is a movie that um, is very sentimental, um, quite moving. I don't think it's a great film. I, 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 of those two, I would definitely prefer for The Power of the Dog to win. But The Power of the Dog, despite its brilliant performances, despite its technical mastery, um, it's a movie that appeals to me because it's there's a very cerebral element too, and it's very dark and and cold and and brooding. And some people don't like that in their movies, and they want something a movie that feels like a warm hug, like Coda does. We're gonna go first to Steve Crone. Steve Crone was the former president of Village Roadshow Pictures and one of the most informed people on the topics that we're discussing. I know you talk more about movies than movie criticism, but I, I'm wondering if you can say something about the state of your profession with the proliferation of these plate sites like Rotten Tomatoes, where people now just want to get a percentage rating and they, they may not read movie criticism the way they used to. Yeah, no, I actually, I actually sometimes love talking about movie criticism, even though it's, it's where I, it's, it's just living in my head all day, but yeah, I, I just, I, I've said this before and we'll say it again. I, I am very grateful and don't take for granted um, the job that I have as a, as a critic for the LA times. And um, it's uh, where, which does give me the latitude to write what I hope are thoughtful, um, informed reviews that are trying to give you more than just a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, Rotten Tomatoes, you know, um, I, I don't think it's been great. Well, I think it's been great for Rotten Tomatoes. That's what else other ways to put it. I mean, because they are now, because you will have studios who so, you know, watch with great anxiety over what their movies score there. And that score is a representation of many critics. But are those critics being read? I mean, you know, a lot of colleagues, you know, take great pride in announcing that they are a tomato meter approved critic. And that is that accords them a certain stature and, and a certain profile, I guess. But are people actually clicking? Are people actually reading what they have to say? Or are they just another, you know, just kind of a number, just something, just, be, you know, just one more addition to that, that meter. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate because, you know, a platform with the weight of the LA times and, and, you know, it can, you know, does ensure me, yeah, people, people will, a certain number of people will read it, but I don't think it's, I, I don't think that that kind of, aggregation is great for criticism i don't think i i don't think kind of this sort of search for consensus i don't think is good for just the dissemination of ideas in general so um i don't know i mean if people were actually clicking on those critics and reading what they have to say i think it would be a very i i would see then I, my view toward it would be much more favorable but yeah i mean you know and of course this has been going on for many years and it's like there are one reason i'm so grateful for my job is that there are far fewer full-time critic jobs anywhere um, it was not great when I first started out and it's even worse now. So I, I really don't take for granted my position. We are going to go to our last question of the night. Andrea, over to you. I'm curious about, um, how you actually, what, what do you do to put your top movies of the year list together? Can you describe that process a little bit? Absolutely. What a, thanks, Andrea. I'm glad you've been enjoying the conversation. And what a great question, because I actually do have a process that I can speak to. I started doing this a while ago, where I do keep a running list throughout the year. Um, I, I, I vote in, I'm, I belong to two critics groups, the uh, Los Angeles Film Critics Association and the National Society of Film Critics, and um, which have, you know, a lot of the a lot of categories. And so I actually want to remember work throughout the year. And not do what I think the Academy and other awards-giving bodies do, which is 
to um it, it tends to be very biased and there's kind of a recency bias so everything that gets what largely what gets nominated for oscars tends to open in the fall right it's that kind of um and so but what about movies that opened in february like like say the science of the lambs which was a february release and was the rare february release that actually won a ton of oscars including best picture so it's like um it's it's very important to remember the good work throughout the year stuff that does not arrive with the this aura of prestige attached to it and um and uh, and so i write it down i, I keep a list in all in a bunch of categories to performances that i like and especially i am thinking about my year-end top 10 or as in my case it's often a top 20 list and um and i'm sort of always futzing with it throughout the year and then around december when i have to turn the damn thing in of course um i start um i start seeing okay what can i live without what can what needs to go on here what can go off and it is hard but something i've been doing with my list in recent years is to pair my titles. And I know that seems weird because, but like, I love it when movies sort of speak to each other sort of thematically. And I find that that happens. And so this year, my top two favorite movies were, um, actually it was three. I did a trio at the top this year. I was ambitious. Uh, I did drive my car, the souvenir part two and procession. It's a wonderful documentary, all of which I sort of lumped under a theme of, okay, these are all movies that are about dealing with grief through art. Um, and then I, so I, I, I find these, you know, and it's not that I find these and then I arrange my list accordingly, but sometimes how much I love something is so like, do I love this movie more or that movie? Those judgments become very arbitrary for me at a certain point. And like, is that what, do I like my number five better than my number six? You know, it's like, I don't know. It changes by the day. So I found that by sort of, grouping things together by the kinds of movies they are by ideas that was a really nice way of sort of both drawing attention to the movies and also just drawing the reader into a conversation like look at how these movies are talking to each other um it's really interesting isn't it and sometimes these are totally sometimes the, the pairings are kind of whimsical and, and ridiculous but i always find it really interesting the way completely different artists can have a similar point of view or maybe a contrasting point of view about something. Um, so that's kind of how I bring it all together. And then I cram in about like 20 or 30 or 50 honorable mentions, which is ridiculous. It's like, Justin, you basically just showed us, gave us your whole year in movie going. And it's like, I know, but I saw a lot of great movies and I want them all to be heard of so to get their moment. So, but you do have to draw the limit. That's all we have for you today. Again, huge thanks to Justin Chang, the LA Times, and NPR's Fresh Air, to our audience for their questions, and to you for being here. As a reminder, like all of our episodes, this is an edited version of a much longer conversation that was taped live with real audience questions. For information on how to join us or to hear past episodes, please visit our website, pm101.live. Please also take a second to subscribe on whichever streaming service you're using right now so you don't miss our next episode this Monday featuring Marcy Wheeler, an independent journalist who specializes in national security and civil liberties. This has been Politics and Media 101, produced in partnership with Clubhouse. I'm Jeff Browning. On behalf of Justin Higgins, our co-founder and our team, thank you very much for being here. We hope to see you and hear from you soon.